Hello, I'm Paul Richards with the latest from science, where we invite scientists to offer their views on the issues of today. The COVID-19 challenge has called for researchers from all fields of science to contribute. But how can an astronomer help? Dr. Sam Hinton is an astrophysicist working with the COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium. It's still early days, but Sam hopes his work on a data sharing portal will help clinical staff choose the best treatments. Welcome, Sam. Hey, Paul, how's it going? Yeah, very well, thanks. Now, you work in astrophysics. What does that have to do with COVID-19? It turns out uh, not much, but the skills that you get from astrophysics, turns out they're fairly translatable. And that's essentially how I ended up dedicating half of my life to all the COVID studies and trying to keep half astrophysics. It's a hard juggling act and I've definitely dropped a few balls. So big apologies to my collaboration members and thank you for uh, picking up the slack. So Sam, tell me about how you have translated your skills as an astrophysicist to COVID-19. Right, so it turns out that the two fields are actually more similar than, than you might initially not think, right? So in astrophysics, we get raw, messy data that we can't use from a telescope. We then have to take this data, homogenize it, process it, store it somewhere, and then we as researchers can actually make use of it. And it's, it's the same in the COVID collaboration. We take raw messy data, but instead of from a telescope, we take it from hospitals. We still have to clean it up and process it and standardize it, and then we can use it. So essentially, you swap out the, the telescope and you place in 350 hospitals, and you hope that they're similar enough that you can actually get something of value out. Yeah, t- tell me a bit about what, you know, the, the difficulty and the challenges with collecting data for COVID-19. The, the main issue is that it's in the medical field. The medical field is messy inherently. It's to do with the human body, which is not a nice, simple piece of software. It's not a nice little database with three different columns. No, it's, it's this disgusting mess of biology and you're trying to keep track of all of it. So our big issue is that where this collaboration, uh, not within Australia, we have 48 different countries. And unfortunately, Um, those countries have different standards. Uh, They use different units, they measure different things in different ways, but they're just giving us the data and we have to somehow standardize it, create a a homogenous product to actually do analyses on it. it. It doesn't seem very feasible, but we're trying to make it work. And so far, we haven't been unsuccessful. So I'm very happy with that. Yeah, that's um, that's a massive challenge. I mean, you talk about that number of countries, there's languages, there's time zones, as well as the, the units of measurement. So, I mean, what's the secret to trying to pull that together? Is it just blood, sweat and tears or is there, yes. you know, how did you do yes, it? So much blood, sweat and tears. Um, essentially, the, the whole thing started where we got this database and initially everything, well, most of the data came from Italy. Obviously they had the first big outbreak. So most of our, our data, like 80% was in Italy. And that was when we got the first few challenges. I remember being asked questions like, uh, how many patients are on X antiviral drug? And I, I looked for it. I'm like, well, none of them. It turns out the drug has a different name in Italian and in Spanish. And there's several spelling mistakes because there's free text. And so essentially we started with this bare bones mapping column A to column B from the data that we pulled from Oxford. So essentially the way it works, all the hospitals have their own local data. They then fill out forms, push it, push it out to Oxford, who keeps it all safe and secure. UQ then says, hey, Oxford, can we have some of this data? We get that over a secure connection. We then have to post-process it, standardize it, and then put it on UQ's secure servers for our researchers to try and actually glean insights from. Uh, and I've just slowly been trying to cater for more and more use cases. And it's, it's also quite difficult because The study that I'm part of, the COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium, is essentially a sub-study of ISRIC. ISRIC is the big uh, UK-based one that has, you know, 70,000 patients enrolled. Uh, But we, instead of having so many patients, we go deeper. So we go for depth rather than breadth. But because we're a sub-study, we're dependent on them. And whenever they update their database, that updates 
our database. And what, what keeps happening is they're like, well, this is an interesting thing to keep track of. We're going to keep track of it now. And we've been keeping track of it since day one. So now we have like duplicate fields with potentially different default units. And we're trying to just merge them all together, make it work. Um, it's fun. Blood, sweat and tears. That's really it. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me how this data is used. I mean, I can only imagine the work that's gone in to try to make it all uh, collated and, and make it accessible. But how, how does it help in the fight against COVID-19? So it's been used in a few different ways at the moment. Um, one of the ways that I've been most personally involved with is through a dashboard. So the collaboration members are given access to a private dashboard that essentially aggregates the data. Uh, and at some point it allowed them to try and derive certain insights from it. So you could see the demographics of people going in. You could try and uh, look at features based on country, based on gender, uh, based on outcome. So you could say, you know, what is the chance that a person would develop this complication, uh, whether they're male or female, uh, whether they come from the US or not. So we give that dashboard, uh, the clinicians will sometimes log in, whether that's every week, every month, you know, it's up to them, uh, get the new data and then try and, and figure out if there's anything interesting that we should follow up on. So obviously they can use it themselves, but what we also get is someone will come across some interesting trend in the data. And I, I don't know what's interesting or not. I don't have the, the medical context to determine Determine that. So the researchers at UQ, primarily apart from uh, our lead, Sally Shrapnel, aren't clinical doctors or don't have like a clinical background. So we just sort of sit here waiting and then someone will say, hey, it's weird that compliance, that's lung compliance, how much the mechanical ventilators need to push to force air in and out. And they're like, well, that's far lower than normal. This doesn't look like what we thought. And so now we're like, okay, okay, hold on, hold on. And then we will frantically code up some various plots or models or try and get them the statistics they want. And then we send that back. So we sort of, uh, science as a service, so to speak. How has it pushed and inspired you working on this project? Uh, so it's definitely pushed um, in the sense that I've been trying not to drop my responsibilities in the astrophysical world, uh, which means there's a lot to do. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, th I think the best example was I got married during COVID. I got married on April 1st and I spent the night of my wedding uh, creating plots for some of the the uh, clinical staff at the Prince Charles Hospital because we were having the global consortium meeting the next night and we needed the plots done to present to the 300 or so hospitals that were enrolled then. Uh, so that's been pushing, um, but I've definitely learnt a fair bit about uh, that, you know, perhaps the medical industry and the data gathering needs some form of revolution because the amount of bureaucracy, obviously, there's, there's all the, the patient safety uh, and confidentiality, privacy concerns, but they're different for every country. And we're trying to get 50 countries on board. Standardization doesn't exist, uh, you know, in things like the units, even in ways of getting the data, the data that we want is all stored already on the computers in the database system of each hospital itself but there's no way of extracting that information apart from manual labor. So what we have to do is ask these people who have been, you know, flat off their feet, wearing gowns, uh, you know, the masks, they're at the end of a 12 hour shift. And we say, hey, can you just stay back for like five more hours and just enter data for us? And the answer is like, obviously not. No one wants to do that. Uh, we've tried to solve this in various cases in Germany. We've had medical students uh, go around to the different hospitals. And so they're, they're not taking care of patients. Uh, all their job is, is to essentially take the, the German records, the CRFs that we have, and just translate them into our schema. So they just sit there and type away. But all of this is unnecessary work. We could have vastly more data if we could just interface with the hospital systems. But there are so many, each of the systems is different. There's you know, privacy concerns. It just makes it completely and totally unfeasible. Where you point out that like we could be saving far more lives if we could just get access to this, but it's just not on the cards. Yeah, definitely um, sort of brings to light those challenges and, and areas for improvement. What about in uh, astrophysics? Um, for you, your, your day job, as it were, um, uh, what lessons have you learned that you'll perhaps take back and now apply to uh, the, the other work that you do? 
That's a great question. Um, I don't think there are too many technical things that I've learned uh, in the sense that the, the flow of expertise more came from Astro and went to COVID. I have picked up a few new skills, um, just things are like different ways of displaying data to try and communicate clearly, because that's one of the big issues that we have. Uh, IBM coined it, uh, uh, what was it? Glanceable consumability. So someone needs to be able, you know, a medical doctor with a dashboard at a, at a client's bedside doesn't want to spend 10 minutes poring over plots and text. They want to be able to glance at the figure and know exactly what's in there. And so it's really helped me sort of pare down to absolutely what's essential and get rid of everything else. So I'll probably be taking that back, uh, not so much for you know the scientific papers we publish, but whenever you're giving a public talk or presenting your results, it's a lot easier now to spot what I would call a bad plot or just a bad way of presenting data because now that I've had 10,000 people ping me and say this has confused me, I'm much more aware of every conceivable way that a plot can be misinterpreted. Yeah, that's fascinating. Now, um, you were about to move to the US to start a new job. Um, this time last year, could you have ever imagined that you might be working on a project like this during a pandemic? Well, no, because I didn't think there would be a pen. You, you would have thought if this had been the 21st century uh, and with you know enough warning of a pandemic that everyone would just have it under control, have it locked down. I, I forgot about... Um, certain people and their attitude towards, you know, locking down and, and meta, you know, who would have thought uh, that these sort of issues would become so politicized and, and so, uh, you know, so strong? I, what is going on? Uh, so no, absolutely no idea that this would happen, would never have thought of that it would occur. And then it also raises the question for me, what on earth is happening over in the United States? And so I, I accepted a Chamberlain Fellowship at the start of the year, in January, and I'm supposed to be there pretty soon, but obviously that isn't happening. I don't know when it will happen. I don't know if it will happen. So I'm very grateful for the, the consortium uh, because I'm able to work part-time for them, which means I'm not completely you know out of a job if it comes to the end of the year and I'm still here in Australia. But fingers crossed that everything magically turns around. Um, not quite sure how that's going to go, but fingers crossed, and we'll see. Well, what a what a massive year! Getting married, um, plans to go to the US, but now you know it may still happen. But you've you've uh, done this incredible work, and and I guess you know really inspiring work, uh, helping with the response uh, to COVID nineteen and helping to to save lives. Um, so look, Sam, thank you so much for all your work, and uh, good luck with it. Thanks, mate. Cheers. And you can read more about how astronomers are using their data analytics skills to help solve the COVID-19 pandemic in the midterm review of the Australian 10-year plan for astronomy published this week. Don't forget you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell so you never miss a future episode of the latest from science. I'm Paul Richards. See you soon.